All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today's topic, Bo, this is a this is a hot topic for us. We often spend a bit of time talking about this one between ourselves because there's so many horror stories out there. And the topic today is the don'ts of dry needling. Yeah, there's um, there's plenty of them. <laughs> there is. It's a bit of a worry. Some of the things we see, particularly social media, and look, social media is a great place to be able to promote your clinic and share what you do and the different modalities you use. And dry needling is a pretty visually impressive kind of modality so we see a lot of photos and videos of people dry needling uh, and for the most part it's pretty good but there's there's a few out there that make us shake our heads and maybe cringe a little right oh 100 it's it's funny and it's a good exercise for everyone to do just search the hashtag dry needling i've done this myself before and um you sort of you, you see all sorts of weird and wonderful things but um yeah you often do see these uh it's sort of like overdoing it just for the sake of a photo and you see this sort of symmetrical needling it's like well was there really a trigger point in those exact spots on the same spot each side and was there 15 in that same spot as well it's like come on yeah (laughs) that symmetry is a good one is we often bring that up in courses where um and people will laugh and will say it at the same time it happens so often isn't it like you'll see three needles in the upper traps one in each suboccipital side of the neck you've got Two in the rhomboids, and you've got just this symmetry. And the human body typically doesn't present with symmetrical problems like that, does it? Yeah, it looks great for a photo, but yep. is it getting the, the the most bang for your buck out of that needle and giving your patient the best best outcome possible? Yeah, um, yeah. I, th- I think that that is a common mistake because people fall into the habit, and we, we've all been guilty of this. Where we see problem tension in the traps, for example, where we just in relation to that example I just gave, tension the traps. So when I needle the traps, I put two needles in and I put them here and here, rather than thinking about where is the trigger point, where is that torque band, which side is tighter than the other, what technique should I use for each one, how should that vary from side to side, as opposed to, like, here's what I do for traps, here's what I do for deltoids, here's what I do for hamstrings. Exactly. And the fundamental basics of dry needling is palpation, you know, good palpation, good knowledge of anatomy, but, you know, and manual therapists are typically really good at palpation, but it's something that's just missed. Like you said, this is where I put the needle for this particular muscle. Well, yeah, that gives you a guide, but you've got to go back to those basics and, and palpate the tissue, feel the, the the depth of tissue feel for the recreation or feel for the trigger point and you want to confirm that with your patient as far as the recreation of their familiar symptoms so if you can't recreate their familiar symptoms then it, you'd question as to why you're needling that that particular spot for sure for sure all right let's dive into a different one then what about uh, re-threading needles now i think this is it's still a fairly common practice with a lot of acupuncturists where they'll take the needle out, re-thread it back into the guide tube and then go to use the needle again. And there's two problems with that, at least from my perspective. One is the re-threading because there's a higher risk of um, puncturing your own finger, getting a needle stick injury. And the second part of that, of course, is you're reusing a needle. And we all know what happens. Well, maybe not everyone, but it's there's, there was a study done at RMIT in Melbourne that showed the effects of a needle after it's been taken out. The tip of that needle and a lot of the needles are just bent. It's bent over. So that's now... You're needling with a very dull tip and almost a little hooked barb on the end of that needle. So not a good idea. Yeah, definitely. And again, depending on the, the quality of the needle, like you, um, needles aren't that expensive. Uh, so <laughs> just use another one. <laughs> Take yeah. it out, put it in the shelf container, start again. I'd far rather uh, that than, you know, having a needle stick injury and then you've got that. Uh, you know, the risks of, of a bloodborne uh, infection are very, very low, but, you know, you've still got that three-month waiting period. So, um, yeah. yeah, avoid that if you can. Yeah, and also the, just the discomfort of a blunt needle. Yeah. You know, like that you're going to create more discomfort for that patient. So if they're already sensitised, if they've already got a really, you know, painful trigger point or if they're already maybe a little anxious about dry needling and you're poking the same needle in again, it's almost inevitably going to be more painful. So it's just unnecessary. Yeah, definitely. I agree. What else we got? Uh, one thing that sort of grinds my gears a little bit is um, just overly aggressive needling. 
right. out without sort of getting feedback from a patient. Like you see this on videos all the time where someone will go to needle and instantly they're, they're pissing, they're, they're fishing around very aggressively. And you can see that the patient's in, in discomfort. The issue with that is that you're not feeling through the layers of the tissue. So it's harder to know exactly where you are. Um, but again, if we're, if we're trying to be much more specific and slow with our approach, we can get elicit the, the, the intended response, that local twitch response. Um, we could bring up the patient's symptoms without taking them too high, that it's, that it's uncomfortable. Everything that we should do should be fairly comfortable. You know, there might be a mild amount of discomfort, but we don't want to really heighten that patient's autonomic nervous system where they're sort of in that fight or flight, that reactive environment, and they're tensing up, they're guarding, um, which could essentially amplify their pain experience. So take it slow, feel the layers. You know, you want to look for their that recreation of, of their familiar pain. And then it's bringing it back out to the surface if you didn't didn't get that, that desired response and then slightly changing that angle. And doing this gently and, and confirming with the patient what they're noticing, I think that's, that's really important um, to get the best response without being just overly aggressive. But, and you'll see that overly aggressive technique, if, if you're ever going to break a needle, that's how it would happen. So take it easy, um, nice, gentle approach. That's, that's key. Couldn't agree with that more. And we've all probably had an aggressive needling experience as a patient. And the difference in post-treatment sensation for someone who's been really targeted and specific and, and um, yeah, like intentional in their technique versus someone who's popped the needle in, pecked around like crazy, elicited a bunch of twitch, twitch responses or not, just, you know, pecked the tissue to pieces and then bailed with the needle, taking the needle out. And you will walk away tender and sore. Every time that needle passes through muscle fibers, it's going to create some damage, some inflammatory response. And so if you're puncturing away like you're trying to poke holes in, you know, something, then you will create a larger area of sensitized tissue and, and inflammation and more of that post-treatment soreness, which is really a well-performed treatment shouldn't cause any post-treatment soreness if the dosage is right, if the application is correct. And that's a great point. Dry needling is dose dependent. Um, you know, Shah and colleagues have demonstrated that dry needling can decrease the levels of substance P and CGRP and changes to that um, the, the, the pH in the tissue. But there's been other studies that have shown that too much dry needling can have the opposite effect. It can increase those biomarkers and increase a patient's pain experience. So, um, you know, and that's why it's hard when someone says, well, you've got a needle for five minutes or I put the needle in for 10 minutes and, and that's it. Well, it depends on every single patient. Everyone's going to Absolutely. respond differently. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you might be you might be working with someone who's never had needling before and you might just do a very, very small dose of needling and that's enough for them. Whereas someone who's had a lot of uh, experience receiving dry needling before and you know how they respond, you can be that little bit more aggressive with your approach in that particular population. Um, so yeah, it really is dose dependent, but we've always got to think about what's happening from a cellular level and being very aggressive uh, to that tissue could potentially have the opposite effect of, of what we're trying to achieve. For sure. We often talk about in our courses by the Arndt Schultz law. You know, this is a bell curve of effect. You know, you could put a needle in the wrong spot, create no sensation, you get no effect. But the right spot with almost the right depth, you get a little bit of effect. But too much of the same thing, but the right amount of the same thing gives you optimal. Knowing how to get to that point and then taking the needle out and say, that's the end of my session. That's the real skill of a, of a real targeted therapist. But if you're pecking away like crazy, getting twitch responses, coming out your ears, then you're going to start to come down the other side of that bell curve and you'll end up in a worse situation than you started. That is something that happens way more often in our professions, I think, than we we, than we want to admit. Yeah, definitely. That Goldilocks principle, right? Um, and look, I don't have a problem with with an aggressive approach in some cases. For That's the right. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and it's always someone that, that I've previously needled before. I know how they respond. Um and, you know, yeah, like understanding those, those different variables, but, you know, someone might've, might've had a bad day. They're increased in, in their levels of stress. They've had a poor night's sleep. And then on that day, they might be less tolerable to, to needling as well. So we've got to factor that in. 
Yeah, and also you've got to think about too, what's their um, schedule following treatment? Do they need to perform high levels of athletic ability? You know, aggressive te needling technique can leave muscle quite inhibited, weaken, decrease muscle tone, less optimal tone. And so that person goes, oh, great, I feel, you know, it's a bit tender, but, you know, it's better. I'll head off to the gym and throw some heavy weights around or go for a run. And then as a result, they end up injured because that inhibition that you produce through too much aggression. So it's not just about discomfort. It's not just about the tissue. It's also about optimizing for capability. What is What does that person need to do afterwards? There's a few muscles like that in the body, especially the, the traps, the calves. Um, what else have we got? Like muscles of, of the hand. Uh, you needle them and you go too hard on them and they will know about it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if you've ever had your calves needled and, you know, you, you try to get off the table afterwards and it's been too much, then it, it's pretty hard to walk. So. You know, you absolutely remember that experience yeah. for the rest of your life. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay, you got any more there? What else have we got on the list? Um, what about needling in areas that you can't see well? So I've seen that people <laughs> um, needle through clothes or through tape. This yeah. boggles my mind. I, yeah. Why? Why would you needle through a pair of tights or someone's underwear or, a, you know, something like that? If you can't see the skin, you don't know what the integrity of that skin is like. Is there a rash? Is there an infection? Is there some kind of lesion on the skin that you could be passing through? And then what's happening after the needle's in? Let's just say you've missed all those dangerous things or potentially irritating things. And then you take the needle out and they get a bleed. Or they've got a sub, you know, double hematoma. They're, they're bruising into the tissue, and you can't see it. Like, what is the advantage to, to needling through clothes other than laziness? You know, I can't see. I see no reason for it. Yeah, I've literally seen images of um, someone in underwear where there's a towel draped over them, and they've still needled through the underwear. <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, yeah, I've forgotten the right, critical you know, step. <laughs> that superficial vasculature, you know, you, you can't see that. Um, right. But the the potential infection risk, you know, you're passing through the clothes to to get yeah. there. So, um, yeah, it's 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 sort of like why or use a different technique if you can't drape someone and you know they're wearing tights or whatever and they 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 can't get unchanged for whatever reason, don't needle them. Do a yep. different technique. <laughs> there are other ways to skin that cat, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, um, look, I've, I haven't come across too many people needling through clothes. I hear about it. We've seen pictures of it, um, but it just makes no sense. And I'm sure there's people listening or watching this thinking, why? And I'm hoping that that's what people listening and watching are thinking because it's such a bad approach to needling, but it exists nonetheless. Yeah, but even worse is, is tape, and I've seen that a few times. Um, through tape, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, you know, the chemicals that are in tape, for one, um, mm. But when you wear tape for a period of time, the, the underlying skin is uh, gets a little bit grotty and nasty. Mm. But, um, there's all sorts of different uh, potential germs that are on the skin and in the tape and in, in the chemicals of the tape as well. Yeah. So. It's a worry. Okay, that's a big don't. That's <laughs> a big don't for sure. Well, now, this is one of my um, bugbears as well because um, I'm a, a big fan of electro dry needling. Yeah. Um, and so... We'll often see people will have, you know, electrodes that will attach to the needles as opposed to a handheld device. So you attach little alligator clips to the needles, which is fine as a technique, and you'll see that muscle pulsing away. And there's a couple of um, issues that I have with approaches that people take. One is they'll use um, too many needles in the region. So they'll have, you know, 10 needles, and they'll be stemming across two that are on the outside. So there's all this muscle contraction with a whole bunch of needles inside the belly of the muscle that is contracting. And so those fibers, those sliding filaments, the sarcomeres are trying to drag against these needles which are, which are passing through them. So there's a lot of shearing forces going on unnecessarily. Whereas we could just have place a needle at either end of a muscle belly, stem through that belly and we've got only those two needles and then a muscle that's, con that's free to contract. You know, that's, that's one, a better way that we could obviously do it. Um, and another thing is you, you'll see people using all sorts of crazy frequencies where the muscles are pulsing a thousand miles a minute uh, or they're, uh, you know, using all sorts of, here's another one for you. This is my, my least favorite of all. You'll have about 15 cables attaching to one hamstring, needles all over the place, alligator clips everywhere. And there's just, you know, six different inputs driving the one muscle. So this muscle is having to create, receive all this stimulation from different 
uh, channels of input, sometimes different frequencies across those different channels. Um, and I'm sure the poor patient laying on the table has no idea what is happening, can't give effective feedback because they can't actually perceive what's going on, don't know whether they're in pain or whether it's tickling or whether it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just too much input for that nervous system. Yeah, massive, massive amount of bombardment. If, if someone's already in, in pain and there's all this extra input, you know, the, the central nervous system is going to get pretty, pretty fried and pretty wired. Um, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's it's a lot for the for the patient. And yeah, it might look great for an Instagram photo, but is it really benefiting the, the patient maximally? Could we could we achieve the same result with just the input from two needles with a stim on each. That's right. I think coming back to your point initially at the start of this conversation too, which is right, we've got to be targeted with our approach. What's the outcome we're trying to achieve? What's really the minimal viable dosage of input to the body to achieve that? You know, that Schultz law again, how do we get to the top of that curve without going over the other side? We can be very impressive and spend 15, 20 minutes setting up all this equipment to produce lots of stimulus for the body. But the body doesn't need lots of stimulus. More often than not, when it's in a heightened pain state, it's overstimulated. It's in that sympathetic nervous system state. We need to reduce input. We need to reduce stimulation more often than not. So it's, you know, electro stim, electro um, drawn needling. I'm a massive fan of it. I think it's brilliant when used appropriately, but very easy to overstimulate, overtreat with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And another one that I see quite a bit um, is, and it's probably not the worst thing, but it's just, something that makes me think a little bit is when you'll see someone that will have cups on and needles in the same area, mm. what, are you, what are you trying to achieve? You know, we think about well, what are the mechanisms associated with dry needling versus cupping and do we need both or could we get away with one? Um, you know, do we need to have both at the same time? It's um, yeah. What do you, what do you reckon about that one? Well, on that same point, we, we often get questions like, I like to do a lot of massage and cupping, and then now I'm learning needling from you guys. Which one should I do first? Well, maybe you won't do all of them. Maybe you'll just do one of them. And then for some patients, you'll do two or three of them. And for some patients, you'll do that one first and that one first, and they get confused with the answer. But the answer is, it depends. It depends on the patient. And so if you've got cups on a hamstring and then needles down the other side of that same leg or that same hamstring, yeah, what are you trying to achieve? You're creating decompressive force with the cups, um, some myofascial work that you're doing some tissue stimulation, neurological stimulation with the, the needle. And we ask the question, why? And often the answer is, oh, I like to cup first and then needle. So I cup one side and then I take the cups off and I put needles in and then I move the cups to the other side. and I cup, and then, Okay, you, you're following a recipe and the human body doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's it, it, the answer is always, it depends. And then you've got to go into why. You know, what is the history? What is the, the clinical presentation? And then understanding these mechanisms, which we talk about so often, understanding the mechanisms effect with your modalities and being able to strategically choose the technique that makes the most sense for that person on that day and then put them in the order that makes the most sense. That's a skilled therapist and that's hard, but that's our goal. Yeah, be. definitely. Not going through a sequence of this is how I do it in, in this order and I've got to free up that leg to do this. It's it's Yeah, it's a lot. Um, yeah, when we think about well, what are we trying to achieve with with dry needling? Well, we can take away pain. It's fantastic pain modulator, particularly in yep. people who are a little bit more sensitized. You can use a more aggressive approach for stimulation. You know, they've shown improved in single legs uh, balance in more of an aggressive pistoning type technique in the fibularis muscles. Yep. Um, so you know, we can use that as from a neurological mechanism. Um, when you look at something like massage or myofascial cupping you're trying to change the, the tone or calm the, the the patient's nervous system down um so if we're doing all of those things at once yeah it's sort of like are we getting to the peak of that curve and going down the other side and and leading to, to overstimulation so often um less is more um but there always should be some form of clinical reason clinically reasoned explanation as to why we chose to use that particular technique and not just because I want to get as much done in a short period of time. Uh, yeah. that sort of, uh, that, that's where it's going the wrong way. Yeah, you look, more is not better. And we've all seen photos of therapists that work with, they've got a heat lamp on the, on the neck and head and they've got needles through the mid back. They've got cups across the low back and glutes and they've got a scraping tool down on the calves and then they've got something else on the ankle and you think, well, 
what an amazing approach to treatment this is. And it's just carpet bombing the human body. It's there's no strategy, there's no targeting. It's just as much input as possible. And at least I, I think you agree with me, at least from our perspective, um, it's it's not the way to go. Not the way to go. No, I agree. Okay. What about um here's one that's sort of it's a bigger one, um, a bigger topic, and it's something I think we need to address it. It's needling beyond your own ability. Now, everybody has their own level of skill based on time on the job, how long have they been on the tools for, how long have we been doing this for? But I overlaid with that your your detailed perception and understanding of anatomy. And we're talking musculoskeletal, but also neuro and vascular structures within the body. If you know the, the human body inside out and you've got really good skill, then your ability to needle just about anything in the human body is quite good. You can needle almost anything with confidence. But if you've been a therapist for 30 years and you learned needling yesterday, you could consider yourself a beginner, um, especially if your knowledge of anatomy is not you know, brilliant. Um, and vice versa, you could have amazing anatomy knowledge uh, and you're, you know, you're only a new therapist, so your palpation skills may be, might not be that great. Well, then you've got to consider yourself a, a beginner and build up from there. And so this idea of um, I want to learn how to needle everything, I want to learn how to needle scalenes, and I want to get um, into, you know, an axillary, I want to dive into the groin, I want to do deep pelvic stuff. I think it you really have to, there needs to be a, a, a scaffolding approach to this in your knowledge and your application. 100%. And go back to the, the mechanisms of dry needling, the whole neurophysiology behind it. Well, could you treat that area by looking at the, the spinal segments rather than going straight to that peripheral area. Like often uh, get asked, oh, could you needle uh, serratus anterior? It's like, well, I mean, you probably could, but why? Like the, the, the risk versus reward. Um, you could potentially go back to, to the spinal segment that, that provides innovation to that area and have a response that way via segmental inhibition. Oh, um, safely. Yeah, for sure. And same with a lot of, you know, um, pelvic girdle muscles. Mm. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a it's a great point. Like, you know, there's certain areas that, yeah, theoretically you, you could needle them, but um, could you do it with another technique if your level of skill isn't quite there, then then choose the, the, the safer option. Yeah, that's right. And so when someone says, is it safe to needle the QL? Well, yeah, if you know how to needle the QL and you can do it, you know. Um, is it safe to needle intercostals? Well, there's a risk versus reward, I think, conversation that needs to happen there. It's possible, and on a really finely built person, I think I could probably needle the intercostals, but the risk massively for me outweighs the reward of that. I'm going to put my finger into that trigger point in the intercostals. I'm going to leave the needle out of that conversation. Um, it's possible, but should you do it? Probably not. And so there's, there's things to weigh. It's a set of scales. You've got to weigh this up. Is it appropriate? Is it effective? Do I have the skill? Is there a better way to treat this tissue for this person? Uh, and you know, dry needling is a brilliant modality, but it's not the it's not the only way to do things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, I, and you and I, you know, we've been we're anatomy nerds, and we're always looking over this stuff and reviewing different approaches. And our approaches have um, changed over the years as well. And, yeah. you know, and we go and look at a, a cadaver, and oh, in this specimen, I saw this. Do you think that we could look at needling this particular muscle in a different way? Um, so, yeah, the, the more that you understand anatomy, the more that you'll understand the risks. And once you understand the risks, you can needle things a lot safer because you know what to avoid. And I think that's yeah. that's the, the main thing, um, you know, knowing where neurovascular structures run and, and how to avoid them. Uh, I think that's really important. Yeah. Look, we you can learn how to draw a needle in five minutes, here's how to put the needle in safely. Here's how to stimulate the tissue. Here's how to take the needle out. That's that's easy, right? That's the that's just the practical skill, an application of the skill. And the true knowledge of dry needling and the, the art of it, if you want to look at like that in the science of it, comes to knowing how, knowing the human body really well. Like you said, anatomy is key. And if you want to get better at dry needling, you know, spend a lot of time studying anatomy. Practice your needling in clinic, but spend a lot of time studying anatomy. That's what will make you a great dry needler. You can go to all the courses in the world. We're all doing the same thing, essentially, some variation, but it's how well do you know that anatomy? Yeah, and nowadays the, the, the level of technology, like the apps that we use are phenomenal. You can look at cross-sections from anywhere in the body. You know, yep. you didn't have that 
10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So it's it's completely revolutionized. Rev- that word, rev- yeah, revolutionized, I think. Is what you think. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed the way that we do things. Um, yeah, that's it. So, you know, if if you're if you're ever worried about your dry needling or or you're not sure about how to needle a certain muscle, go back to your your, your apps or um, whatever app you use, look at peel away different layers, look at cross sections. That way you can sort of figure out the 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 approach that you would take, the angle, um, what, how much depth you have to play with. And then it's, you know, individualizing that to your patient, you know, their, their body shape, their body type, how much fat they have, how much muscle they have. Um, you know, and then always get, get accounting for variables in different differences in um, anatomical variation, the location of, of nerves and, and blood vessels in, in different people. That's right. Yeah, we, we do have more variation in the human body than we probably most of us realize the locations of uh, arteries and, and veins and nerves do vary a little bit from person to person, so some areas more than others. And then you've got differences in bone morphology and changes in you know, shapes of bones and bones that have holes in them in some places and others that don't. And, you know, so we, yes, know the anatomy, but also build in, I think, build in uh, a degree of, um, a degree of fail safeness, if that's the word I'm looking for, like a degree, you want to have margin for error in your approach. And so it's, okay, here's the location to insert this needle to avoid this artery, to avoid this nerve, to avoid this lung. But I need to have a margin for error in this so that if I did not palpate something right or if I perceive something slightly incorrectly, I could still be a little bit off and still be safe. And if you can't build in that margin for error, maybe use your finger or another tool or something other than that needle um, because, you know, risk-reward ratio has to be considered. Yeah, and one of the main rules that we use in most everywhere in the body is approach slowly and ask for feedback because, yeah, there might be. You know, we, we could tell you that this is where the sciatic nerve normally runs, but mm-hmm. there's a good chance there could be a variation. But if you're approaching slowly, you're going to get that feedback and that response from your patient before you do any damage. So then at that point, you can retract the needle, change the direction, again, approach slowly and see, see if that response changes. And that happens all over the body. Mm, for sure. But is there any more? Uh not that I can think of. Yeah. Give us a week. I reckon we could come back and do this all over again. There's so many mistakes that we see. But um, I think, yeah, there's some really good takeaways there. Is You know, less is more typically. N- needle within your own skill level and your own ability and your, and your own experience and, and confidence. Um, don't overstimulate. Uh, don't needle through clothes or tape. <laughs> don't be stupid, I think, is the <laughs> advice. Just... Use some use some common sense, um, and really think about what am I trying to achieve, and am I achieving it in a targeted and, and strategic way, or am I just sticking needles in because I I can? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, hopefully there's some there's some good tips in there for everybody to take away, uh, and hopefully most of the people who are listening to this or watching this uh, haven't fallen trap or fallen into some of these uh, bad behaviours. But if they have, maybe uh, there's there's still a chance to to correct some of those. Yeah, but do a do a um, you know revision course, review course um, regularly. You know, if you you learn something once, you often can uh, pick up bad habits along the way. Yeah, and, yep. You know, everyone does things slightly different, and you know, doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're right or wrong. They're just different, and there's different approaches. And yep. Um, but yeah, it's really useful to to do regular PD in dry needling. Dry needling is. Um, such a great modality and to be good at it you've got to experience um, different approaches from different people and how fast is it evolving there's a huge amount of research coming out in the dry needling space that's changing I know it's changed the way that I practice and teach it uh, multiple times in my career you know 20 something years if I look back at at the way I used to teach it and practice it 20 years ago um, I almost shudder to think you know that the differences that are that are happening now that are, that I've um, applied now are just um, profound. So absolutely keep updating your knowledge and skill, go to courses, read, look at the research, attend conferences, whatever you can do, get information, podcasts, websites, you know, whatever, because uh, it is a constantly moving feast. Um, and, and that's great. It means that we're always improving and we're always trying to do uh, better for our patients. And really that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah I agree. 
Okay, great. We'll leave it there then. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Bo. Thank Talk you. To you soon.